Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second of three sessions on patient-centered research. I'm so thankful that you're able to join us this morning as we continue our educational series. If you attended the October webinar, you would have heard from Jennifer Shaver and myself when we gave an overview of what patient-centered research is and some examples of research that has benefited from engaging patients and other stakeholders. If you missed that session, no worries. Today's session is still very valuable as a standalone webinar, and the recording of all of these sessions will be av made available to attendees afterwards. So today, you'll be hearing from two other members of our team, Daniel Drumtruck and Kyle Tower. Dan is a clinical research coordinator in the clinical research department here at St. Lawrence Health System. He started as an intern, but the whole department was so impressed with him that we actually hired him right out of school when he graduated from Clarkson University with a degree in mechanical engineering. He's been a huge asset to our team, and when he's not at work, he actually supports our North Country community further as a chief and advanced life support provider with the Volunteer Rescue Squad. So welcome, Dan. And Kyle Tower, he is our current clinical research intern, and he also brings the community and student perspective to our project team. Kyle is currently a senior pre-medical student at Columbia University in New York City and is studying fields of neuroscience and behavior. As a North Country native, Kyle started with the research department as an intern in 2019 and has actually been able to continue his work in 2020 because his classes transitioned to online during the pandemic. So unfortunate event, but we were able to benefit from it by having Kyle for a little bit longer than we expected. Um, he's been a huge help to the department and we're going to all miss him when he inevitably goes off to med school, but I really am looking forward to all, all the great things that he's going to accomplish. So that said, our program is titled Learning Together, Leading Together, Shaping Patient-Centered Research in the North Country. And in today's session, Dan and Kyle will be taking a deeper dive into the steps required to run a research study and the engagement principles that researchers can use to ensure patients are engaged along the way. This program was developed by the St. Lawrence Health System Clinical and Rural Health Research Department in collaboration with the Patients Program of the University of Maryland Baltimore School of Pharmacy. We've also been working with multiple patients and members of the surrounding community who are members of our stakeholder advisory committee. And lastly, we'd like to thank our funder, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI, who awarded us a Eugene Washington PCORI Engagement Award, which has made this entire program possible. Kylie's put links to the research department, the patients program, and PCORI's website in the chat for you guys to reference later. So that said, I'm going to hand it over to Dan and Kyle to tell you about the research process. Okay, great. Thanks, Carly. Um, hello, everyone. Once again, my name is Dan, one of the clinical research coordinators here um, in the St. Lawrence Health System. Excited to be here. Um, and with that, I think we'll, we'll get started. Um, so I think a good place to start off uh, for the presentation um, is with some learning objectives. We actually have four of these. Um, so after attending this event, what we want to, uh, to come away with is the ability to identify uh, three important categories of research, um, understanding six essential steps in conducting any research project, demonstrate and explain engagement principles um, of a patient-centered research project, and then we want you to feel confident um, in contributing to a patient-centered research study in your own community. Um, so I guess if, if we do a good job here, everyone will leave with at least a resemblance of, um, of these four learning objectives, and we'll check in with them um, along the way. So quick refresher, for those that are not completely confident on, on PCOR and, 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 and its uh, trademarks and such like that. So what is research? When we talk about research, we're talking about a careful investigation designed to uncover new information. And it's absolutely everywhere you look, right? So research has impact on our everyday lives in places you might not even imagine whether it's various marketing platforms that are, you know, designed to suggest products that you might be interested in. Um, you know, the way our cities are planned, the sewage systems are run, the way the water is delivered, the street outlook, the traffic lights, all that stuff. 
you know, recently we had you know, a lot of political news and all those political surveys are a type of research um, that's designed to uncover you know, general information about which way the country is leaning. Engineering designs are often based in quite heavy research in order to make sure that they're fulfilling a need um, and fulfilling that need correctly. Consumer reports, healthcare, insurance reviews, and the list goes on and on and on. So research is everywhere in our everyday life. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, we're actually gonna be focusing in on a certain genre of research, and that's being the clinical, you know, healthcare type of research. So behind the scenes in healthcare research, um, it's, it's a team effort, right? So we have our researchers, our dedicated scientists, coordinators that work on a team and that's all they look at, they look at the research, but we also have the administrators of the systems. We have healthcare providers and nurses that are often in the field conducting this research. And we have the input of the community members. Um, and at the heart of this process is actually the patient, right? So all five of these come together in order to make um, a team, um, kind of a research team um, that can attack a problem, get that solution, find that new knowledge, and hopefully contribute back to society. So when we look at the larger picture of what patient-centered outcomes research is, it's actually comprised of two portions. It's comp comprised of the research process, which we'll get into later in this presentation, um, with patient engagement, right? So that's what makes PCOR special. Um, and once again, PCOR stands for the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research. Um, so the research process plus patient engagement equals patient-centered outcomes research, um, which is the, the goal that we're striving to right now. So patient-centered outcomes research, what it looks like. So it's about patients, doctors, all these stakeholders having um, I basically, you know, um, a team together that they can come together and make their decisions, um, whether it's about healthcare, it's about that patient caregiver relationship, what that might look like, how caregivers can best meet the needs of all patients, you know, deciding what actually needs to be researched in that community and how that research should be established and conducted. Um, and then how to communicate these research findings to people who can benefit from them. So the whole idea here is that, you know, all these stakeholders in the community, whether it's community members, the providers, the administrators, the researchers, and most importantly, the patients at the end, um, they all come together in order to have that open um, and transparent discussion about what is important to each and every one of them and how um, this can be uh, used moving forward. So that was a quick review. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, you know, comments, concerns, anything like that, feel free to throw them in the chat um, or raise your hand and we can talk about that. But hopefully that was pretty, uh, pretty easy to understand. Um, and if not, that's okay too. So we'll start off with the three types of PCORI funded research. Now Carly actually mentioned what PCORI stood for um, earlier in the introductory slides. It stands for the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And it's actually an institute that was established um, on a federal level that um, works with sites like ours to bring about the use of patient-centered outcomes research. So the first of the three types of research that we're going to talk about is the randomized control trial. So the de definition of this is it's a trial design that randomly assigns participants into an experimental group or a control group. And this is, you know, I said random, you know, almost like rolling a dice or a die in this case, which is, you know, that, that image over to the side. Um, so these are the types of research trials that you often see in a pharmaceutical industry. Um, they're very targeted. They offer a direct experimental intervention. They have very strict requirements um, and they target a very specific patient population. The goal of which to provide safety and efficacy data. Um, and this is all, all, all good and great. You know, my job here as a coordinator is mainly dealing with randomized controlled trials. Um, and they're not, they're not easy to conduct. That's one of the downsides of them. So for example, um, with Dr. Kadar's clinic in rheumatology, we actually conduct various lupus studies, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, um, various indications um, in which we find a very specific patient population that adheres to um, a, a written out protocol. This protocol or basically an instruction book for us can often be two, three, four inches high. It's a you know, huge, huge manual that we're supposed to abide by. 
um, and in there is actually a list of inclusion and exclusion criteria that this trial is designed for. So we're looking for these quote unquote ideal patients that are you know, sick enough um, that they need this treatment, but not too sick that the, you know, get hindered results of the treatment. Um, so this very specific patient population um, is sometimes difficult to find, but it allows us to narrow down and test really one variable, um, which is ideally the experimental treatment. Um, so here's a, a little infographic, an example of what one of these trials look like. So we have our, on our left, our group of actively identified patients that meets the criteria for a study. Um, a lot of them are very similar to each other um, in that they all have the same disease. Um, they all meet the same inclusion criteria and none of them meet the exclusion criteria. And they're split randomly, usually by a computer of some sort, a software or an algorithm into two groups. Um, one of those groups gets the intervention um, or the experimental drug treatment. The other group just gets standard care. They don't get that experimental intervention. So the idea of having a very similar group of actively identified patients and by splitting them into half, the only difference between the two halves is one is receiving that experimental drug and one is not. And this is kind of the gold standard for proving, you know, a point, you know, does this medication work? Does this device work? Um, you know, and you can see this by assessing the outcomes of the two groups. In this case, we have our little green subjects, um, our humans, um, that's you know, people who have had improvement in their disease management versus people in the black, which have not had that improvement. So in this case, it looks like our intervention worked. Um, when it comes to industry trials and pharmaceutical drug trials, there's actually a lot of steps in place um, in order to ensure safety moving forward, um, you know, from, from all the way from that lab portion to even after the medication was FDA approved. Um, right now, if you pay attention to the news or, or, or any kind of media, you're always hearing these buzzwords, phase one, phase two, phase three. But what does that really mean? So in order to make sure that, you know, we're not just making medications, you know, in the lab and synthesizing them and getting them out on the market as quickly as we can and making sure, we want to make sure that they work and that they're safe. So the first step of this is preclinical trials. So these are not in humans. These are lab studies, um, you know, sometimes they can be animal studies, anything like that. Um, and this is to prove a point. This is to prove that the medication has some substance of working um, as well as it is safe to administer. Once this is proven, we can move on to our first phase one study, um, which is the first time that we're studying a medication in uh, people. And this is usually a very small 20 to 80 people you know, participating in this study. Um, and this is really targeted to make sure that there are no immediate adverse side effects um, to this medication. And you know, people aren't getting sick the second they take the medication. And then they'll follow them for a few weeks, depending on the medication, and see, you know, are there any side effects? Um, you know, is it injuring people? Usually this is targeted to just a healthy group of people um, rather than the people with the actual disease indication of drugs designed for, um, but it could be both. In our phase two studies, we're increasing these, this number of participants, usually to about the 100, 300 range, somewhere in there. And we're li really looking for safety, study, uh, safety information. You know, are there any other side effects? Um, and really, we're starting to get a better sense of is the medication effective or not? Um, so as you can see, as we're moving from the preclinical to the phase one to the phase two, we keep on adding more and more people so we can get more and more data points. Once we hit phase three, this is really the kind of the, the, the most important step because this is when we're looking for true effectiveness of the medication as well as any long-term side effects um, anywhere between one to 3,000 people depending on the trial. Um, so really important phase there. And, you, and this is when you actually or a drug company can submit to the FDA for approval once they pass a phase three study. Um, that doesn't mean the research ends there. You move on to your phase four, and this is even longer term side effects, usually after the drug has already been FDA approved. Um, you know, we know it works. We know it's generally safe. The question is, is it safe years and years and years and years from now, you know, continuing? Is there more um, that we can learn about this? Um, so one of the studies that I've actually heard on the news, um, I think it was actually it was two days ago, is that um, Pfizer came out with their um, preliminary data for a phase two uh, COVID vaccine. They said it was 90% efficient, which is great if it is. 
Um, but it's a phase two study. So they're only looking at a few uh, number of people. They're not looking at people, you know, thousands and thousands of people. It's a smaller group, right? So we need to wait a little bit longer to see, um, you know, as we add more people, is it really working, um, you know, in the phase two, in the phase three, um, so that they can submit for that FDA approval. So that covers randomized controlled trials, right? Those, those stereotypical pharmaceutical drug trials, you know, the phase process, everything that you're hearing about right now in the news. Um, and we're moving on to observational studies, you know, the study two. Um, definition for this, it's a study in which individuals are observed or certain outcomes are measured. No attempt is made to affect the outcome. For example, no treatment is given, right? So this is very different from our randomized control trials because in our randomized control trials, we are identifying that patient population and we are assigning half of that population by random treatment and the other half is receiving standard of care. So in this case, we're actually not intervening at all. We're letting nature and, and, and the relationship between doctors and patients work themselves out as they would have without our direct intervention. So this, is, this type of study can actually range from you know, very small, singular, rare event disease and say a case study, um, all the way to large widespread indications. Um, it, it's very useful in studying rare or slow to appear conditions. But one of the downsides is that it, because of the increased patient variability, because we don't have that very strict, you know, similar, uh, I guess we could say homogeneous, you know, the same population of patient, um, that variability and complexity can make it difficult to draw accurate conclusions. Now, with all the statistical tools and computer analysis that we can do these days, um, it's not as big of a problem as it used to be. Um, but that's kind of just one of the you know, inherent downsides of an observational study is we don't have that ultimate control over the patient. It's not as strict. Um, so an example of this would be um, studying you know, the prevalence of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD in patient populations, one of which being a smoker, one of which not being a smoker. Um, so we have a group of routinely followed patients this time instead of actively identified patients. You know, these are patients that are just normally going to their primary care facilities or, you know, or, or have you at a pulmonology clinics. And they're just categorized into two groups based on those lifestyle decisions, one being the smokers and one being the non-smokers. Um, and they're tracked, seen, you know, do more smokers develop COPD, do more, you know, or is there, is there, uh, is there a correlation between smoking and COPD? Possibly, is there not a correlation? Um, you know, how many non-smokers develop COPD compared to how many smokers do? Um, so perfect example of a, of a nice, you know, randomized, or not, excuse me, not randomized, but um, observational study. So here are also a few more examples. Um, one is a case series, um, which was actually conducted here at the St. Lawrence Health System. Um, so it was actually an analysis of the treatment methods that you know, the system and the COVID treatment team um, use um, for 20 COVID-19 positive patients in the clinically rural setting of Northern New York. So this was a very small observational study in the grand scheme of things. We looked at only, <clears throat> we looked at only 20 people all of which were treated within our health system um, in this clinical setting. Um, you know, good thing about it is, you know, it, we were able to de de dive deeply into um, these patients, um, you know, because there's only 20 of them compared to a larger study, say this registry study that the George Washington University Hospital actually conducted, where they collected and studied reported symptoms of over 20,000 COVID-19 positive patients. Their method was using electronic health data records, right? So both observational studies, so both looking at, you know, there's no direct intervention and well, you know, looking at outcomes, comparing them, um, you know, one being a smaller case series, the other being a registry search, um, but they're both kind of achieving the same goal um, and using the same methods to get there, even though one is, um, you know, significantly smaller and kind of more in-person interviewing and such like that. And the other is using, you know, the massive amounts of data that are available um, in our electronic health records. And then last but not least are pragmatic clinical studies. So this is probably the ones that people uh, have heard of the least. I think when we actually did the poll, um, pragmatic clinical studies were one of the, the, the least selected, um, you know, uh, answers. So a pragmatic clinical study. It's a study that focuses on the relationships between treatments and outcomes in a real world healthcare setting. But what does that really mean? 
So pragmatic, you know, it means practical, real, sensible, you know, it's real world um, information. Um, and this is really important. It's kind of a budding um, type of clinical study that's you know, moving forward and getting more traction as we, uh, as we go. Um, it's looking for that randomized clinical trial, that medication and the observational study. How do they relate to the real world? You know, yes, we have um, this homogeneous or this you know, very similar patient population. Um, you know, they're all practically the same type of person. And the only difference is the variable, i.e. the experimental treatment, right? So that might prove a point, but it might not work in the real world. And I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, so a pragmatic clinical study or a real world clinical study um, provides real world data, right? It uses a very large database of people. We're not talking about 20, we're not talking about 20,000, we're talking about hundreds of thousands, if possible, if not more. We want to get as big of a sample size as possible. Um, and once again, techniques and advances in computer technology and softwares and algorithms has helped us get to a point where this is possible. We can crunch large data like this. Um, and the whole point is so that the results can be applied broadly of a pragmatic clinical study to most populations. So while the, in the randomized control trial, we only had um, the medication proven to work for a very select, strict group of people, we know that the results for pragmatic clinical study will work um, similar for anyone, you know, from, you know, that wasn't in the study versus was in the study. Um, a good example of some pragmatic clinical studies actually currently being conducted that you could take part in um, is this Apple Watch concept that, you know, that, uh, you know, people um, have been buying into. Um, I'm not associated with Apple. I feel like an advertisement right now. Um, don't take it that way. It's more about, you know, what they're able to do. So pretty powerful device, right? You know, they kind of designed it even with the most recent updates that it can just take so many data points. Uh, you know, you can take EKGs with it. I think right now you can actually take a pulse ox with it. They added it since, since COVID-19 um, came in. It's tracking your heart rate. It's tracking how much you move. It can track the sound levels around you. This thing is just like an all-in-one, you know, data gathering machine. Um, and with that data, what they're doing is they're actually designing, um, designing um, and conducting some research studies. Um, so one of the studies that they're, they're looking at is the women's health study. Um, so basically, you know, people who have this watch and have an iPhone um, can opt into these studies. Um, there's actually an application designed for it. Um, and the big takeaway here is that they are trying to get 500,000 plus participants in this multi-year study. So we're not looking at 20 participants, we're not looking at 20,000, we're looking at half a million participants. Um, so it's pragmatic by the fact that it has so many people um, in this study gathering all these data points um, that, you know, ideally the results of this should be applicable to, you know, patients in a similar population. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, out of this, you know, study, you know, the results of the study would be similar for people in, in you know, Southeast Asia versus America, because the majority of the half million are probably coming from the United States. Um, but, you know, someone who's not participated in the study versus someone that has and is living in a similar demographic area, the results should be applicable um, one to the other. So the women's health study, um, it's aiming to improve the understanding of menstrual cycles and how they relate in women's health. Um, basically, it's um, looking at um, the information that you're putting into your watch, into your computer, um, and then every month it's sending you just a questionnaire asking you about, you know, your, your previous conditions of polycystic ovary syndrome, infertility, osteoporosis, anything like that, um, asking about your, your mood and this kind of stuff um, on a monthly basis. And it's going on for a few years. Um, and then using that information, they hope to um, draw some conclusions um, about the impact of certain behaviors and habits on the range of reproductive health. Um, another study that they're conducting is a heart movement study. Um, this study is looking at what factors uh, affect heart health and potentially cause deterioration mobility or well-being. Um, so similar concept here, users basically, you know, download this application. Um, I actually went through it when I was doing my research, just play around with it. Um, it's very well done. You know, it clearly states the um, you know, roles that you have as a participant in the study, as well as the roles that they have to you in order to protect your data 
uh, and make sure that um, you know nothing nothing bad can happen to you. So what this one's looking at is um, they want to understand how certain movements and details about heart rate and rhythm could serve as potentially early warning signs in uh, atrial fibrillation is when your heart starts quivering, the upper chambers of your heart start quivering kind of uncontrollably. Um, heart disease or other types of declining mobility. So once again, very interesting study, um, you know, doesn't require much of the end user, i.e. the participant, um, but they're looking for over half a million people to participate in the study. So in that sense, a very pragmatic study. Um, and then the last one that I looked at was the, the hearing study where they're collecting headphone usage data, environmental sound exposure data um, through both the phone and the Apple Watch, um, and then analyzing this to see um, if sound exposure can affect stress levels and cardiovascular health. Now, this one's actually an interesting one because out of the three, this one's a little bit more randomized control, you know, rather than observational, if you will. Um, participants will randomly be assigned to two groups in a study to access, uh, to assess if receiving health app notifications about loud sound exposure can motivate users to decrease or to modify their listening habits. Um, so even though the other two were, you know, all three are pragmatic, the first two were definitely a little bit more observational. Um, and the third one um, was a little bit more interventional because some are receiving notifications that your, your volume may be too loud and some aren't. Randomized controlled trials are pragmatic studies and are observational studies. They're not mutually exclusive, right? So you can have portions of all of these kind of interlaced with each other you can have a randomized controlled pragmatic trial, or you could have a pragmatic observational trial, uh, study. Um, and really depends on how the study is designed, what goals is it trying to fulfill in the end, um, and, and you know, what resources are available um, to it. So I think this is a good time to stop for questions, um, concerns, personal stories, um, anything that people might have. Um, I know it's a lot of information, uh, and like Carly said earlier, the slides will be available um, on our website and uh, recording this presentation. Um, but I'll give it a second, see if anyone has any questions. Kylie, is there anything in, in the chat box? Not yet, just uh, really appreciating a lot of the graphics and how they make uh, it easier to understand. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear. But okay, so if you remember our first learning objective was really to go over those three types of research, you know, the three types of the quarry funded research, if you will. Um, our, our next learning objective was actually to talk a little bit about the research process and how to conduct an actual research study. So the research process, right? Nitty gritty scientific method, if you will. It's a universally accepted process in which a problem is identified a question is asked, relevant data is gathered and analyzed, and the whole goal of this is to see if the original question can be answered. So it's also known as the scientific method. Um, I remember learning about that back when I was in elementary school, um, doing all my science projects and science fairs. Um, but it is a universally accepted process for providing proof, right? Across the globe, you know, if you have these steps um, and you can defend that you did these steps correctly, um, then people um, generally take this as true. It's not an opinion, it's a fact. You know, it's supported by the evidence that you um, acquired. Um, so the research process is like the scientific method. It's adapted a little right now in the clinical environments to ensure patient safety um, in these environments. Um, and you'll see that in a little bit, but it comprises of six key steps. The first of those steps is actually identifying the question that you wanna ask. Um, the second, designing the study. Three, getting approvals. And this is that modification that I mentioned earlier um, to ensure you know, patient safety um, and participant safety, especially when we're in a clinical or um, you know, human environment. We also have to collect the data and we have to analyze that data to see you know, what results it gave us. And then last but not least, we wanna communicate the results and the answers um, so that other people can learn from our project. So we'll go through these one by one. Um, I'll try to keep it interesting. Um, I know there's, there's a lot of them, but um, we'll, uh, we'll make it exciting. So that first portion, identify that research question. Um, many guidelines on how to do this, you know, you, you know, it really could be anything, but 
some of those guidelines, you know, or, you know, selecting a topic area, or searching what existing literature, you know, is out there already, what information is still unknown. And then actually the last step is formulating that question. So it's arguably the most important part of the research process. You know, you got to step back, ask yourself, what do we want to answer? Um, you know, the easiest way to start this is to ask the question, why, right? You know, why does my disease affect my skin? Why does the winter weather make me sad? Why does medicine make me feel better? I mean, these are really simple questions, but they're all questions. Um, I mean, it's what separates us from animals, plants, rocks, everything else, that innate curiosity to ask the question, why? Um, so really important uh, thing. There's so many ways to get to, to that question, um, but really, um, especially in today's world, once you have that topic area and that general question, you know, search, was it already answered um, in previous um, experiments or, you know, or, or, or research? Um, you know, maybe it was answered, but it wasn't answered in the exact way that you wanted it to. And maybe it was a question about, you know, clinical care. But if you looked at it, you realize that it was an answer or a question on clinical care that applied to only urban environments. You know, how can you ask that question slightly differently and relate it to rural environments? Designing the study. So once we have our research question, we're happy with that research question. We have to determine how is the best way to ask it and what is the best way to actually figure out the answer to this. We have to develop the methods. And this is actually the nitty gritty portion of how the experiment is gonna be run. Um, or in this case, the research process is gonna be conducted. Um, you know, what is our end goal um, and how are we gonna get there? Getting approvals. Um, so depending on the type of research and involving whom um, or what, um, you may need to get approvals. Um, you know, most research that is conducted using any kind of human participants um, requires some kind of approval. Um, there's actually institutions in place, um, one called the Institutional Review Board, which is basically this third party, party ethics committee that reviews over proposals um, and research and make sure that the benefits do outweigh the risks of any study. Um, you know, they might advise you that you need to develop an informed consent form um, to basically let your participants know of all the benefits and all the risks in an easy enough way for anyone to understand. Um, if this is so, before conducting the actual trial and gathering your data, you'd have to actually obtain the informed consent from all your human participants, um, you know, before you can actually move forward. This is just to ensure that they're aware of the risks, aware of the benefits, and that they openly and voluntarily um, would like to contribute to that. Um, my favorite part is actually the collecting data portion. This is, you know, when I, when I work as a clinical research coordinator and I'm, I'm meeting with my, uh, my patients um, and we go over how they've been feeling in the last, you know, month since the last time I saw them, you know, have they been taking their medication regularly? Have there been any side effects? You know, what are their vital signs? You know, it's, it's really my favorite part as a, as a coordinator um, is the collecting data. And this is really when you're falling back on your study design, your study methods in order to help you guide forward. Um, some data, uh, data points that could be collected are vital signs, interviews, um, your visits, anything like that. Um, and it's really important here to ensure patient information and rights are protected throughout the entire time. This is once again why that Institutional Review Board or the IRB, that Ethics Committee, is here to help oversee this um, and help to make sure or ensure compliance. So when it comes to actually analyzing our data, there's many different ways to do it. Um, there's, there's mathematical modeling out there, um, descriptive analysis, statistical analysis. You know, you can even write a narrative about what you discovered um, depending on how the study itself is designed. And this is when, you know, if you need to, you can always, you know, contract and consult out with experts that are, that are your professionals in the field of this type of analysis, depending on what the study is. Um, it's a very common thing for laboratories and, and health systems to work together because one, per, you know, happens to be better at processing this type of lab sample and the other one happens to be, you know, better at conducting interviews and they're taking these um, pros from both sides and combining them together and partnering in order to, um, you know, get a better analysis of what that data means. And then last but not least, communicating these results out to others, right? You wanna develop a plan for how you're gonna tell others what you discovered. You might've discovered something, you might've discovered nothing. Either way, you still wanna be able to get that information out there so that people can learn um, and improve on what you did, maybe ask a different question. 
Um, so some methods of communications, presentations, publications, newsletters, online, handouts, brochures, literally it's, it's limitless, you know, it's just getting that information out, you know, and so, so these are the kind of the six steps for that research process, right? And when I talked earlier about, you know, the, the protocols and those big three, four, five inch binders that we get um, when we start a randomized controlled clinical trial, um, all of that is detailed and outlined ahead of time, you know, so if someone sat down wrote down all six of these steps, you know, what is the question, you know, how is the study going to look, the approvals that were already obtained, what is the data that's going to be collected, how is that data going to be looked at, you know, and then how at the end of this and what time frame are we going to get these results out there to the patients that participated in it, um, as well as the general uh, pharmaceutical um, and medical world so that healthcare providers now know about this new therapy and, you know, does it work, does it not work, does it work for some people, not others, you know, I hope you get the point. Um, and this is not just for randomized controlled trials, right? This is for, for every type of study, every type of research is a general research process. Um, that was just the example that I came up with. Um, so recognize the equation, right? So you know, research plus patient engagement equals patient centered outcomes research. Um, it's important to note here that I just focused in on the actual nitty gritty research process, right? So we didn't really talk about patient engagement and how patients come into the process um, to be involved in every step of it. Um, this is actually um, going to be, uh, Kylie Sands is going to be presenting uh, just, I think, under a month from now um, in part three of this presentation or web series. Um, and she's going to be really focusing in on that patient engagement portion. So if you're interested in that side of the equation, um, absolutely RSVP when that comes out. Um, I know she's going to do a great job. So. I know that was kind of cut and dry. It wasn't the most exciting thing in the world, you know, six steps, you know, no pictures, nothing like that. Um, but I think what I'll do is we'll, we'll get into a little story about a man named John Snow, um, often referred to as the father of epidemiology, um, you know, obviously because it's black and white and his day of life is there. <laughs> He's quite old and not with us anymore. Um, but he actually lived in London, right, in the early 1800s. Um, and while he lived in London, he was actually becoming a medical doctor and going through the process of, you know, of interning and, and all that stuff. Um, but to paint a picture of what London looked like in the early 1800s, um, it was about a city of two to three million people. It was the largest city at that time um, across the world. Um, and it was really not planned out, right? And the, the infrastructure wasn't there. Um, you know, the water systems weren't necessarily there. They were starting to get there, but the sewer systems weren't there. Um, you know, they were, they, they weren't what we have today. Let's just say that. Um, and one thing that London was susceptible to was cholera epidemics, right? And so they were constantly having these random isolated outbreaks where it would kill a few thousand people and then it would go away for a little bit and then it would come back and kill a few thousand more people. And this wasn't just London. This was all these major urban, you know, metropolis areas across North America and Europe at the time. Um, so John Snow, uh, so, and the, the general belief behind cholera, right, this is before germ theory, we didn't know, you know, about bacteria and how, you know, diseases are spread or anything like that was, you know, the, you know, the common belief was that it was spread through bad air, you know, infected air. So basically, if one cholera person was next to another cholera person, they were uh, a non-cholera person, they were both breathing, that one would get infected from the other. Um, we now know that this is actually not true, but at the time, Jon Snow actually disagreed with this and reasoned that because the symptoms of cholera were present in the gastrointestinal tract, right? So your stomach, your intestines, all that stuff, and not in the lungs, then it must be spread through water or food, you know, things that pass through the gastrointestinal tract, you know, the stomach and the lungs, instead of the bad air. Because otherwise it would probably be a lung, you know, problem, right? Similar like how we have COVID right now. We know that COVID um, is spread through the air and it affects the lungs. That was his basic general um, rationale or reasoning um, behind why he thought um, that it was not spread through the air, but instead something else. Um, so he did this when he, once he noticed this, he started looking and he noticed that most cholera patients were clustered around specific water pump areas. You know, at this time, uh, there was no, no water pressure or anything like that. What you had to do is you actually had to pump these water pumps in, out of the ground in order to get your water. Um, so thus he posed the question, is the pump on Broad Street infecting people with cholera, right? So there's our research question. Now we want to figure out if it's true or if it's not true. 
So when it comes to um, designing the study, you know, what's the easiest way to test if the, the pump on Broad Street is giving people cholera or is infecting people with cholera? And the easiest way to do that is remove the pump on Broad Street, right? So, you know, we're going to remove access to the suspected contaminated water and then see if the cases of cholera decrease in the region. They might not change, they might go up, they might go down, we don't know. Um, the pictures here actually, um, the one on the left is actually a little memorial um, or monument, I guess you could say, um, that was placed there after the fact. Um, and if you can look in, I don't know if your screens are big enough, there's actually no pump handle on the pump itself. And that's actually how he went about um, to um, inhibit the access of the water. He just removed the pump handle that people needed to use. Um, and then the picture on the right here is a, is a, a graph or I guess a map of the different um, water supply companies and where they intersected. And it was one of the tools he used in order to help um, develop his theory that it was a singular pump um, in the London uh, area. So what he did in terms of looking for approvals, he went to the Board of Guardians, which was kind of the local town board at the time, um, and he asked for approval to inhibit access to this water pump on Broad Street, right? And so they weren't very impressed what evidence he came up with, um, but they ended up agreeing and saying, sure, you know, we'll do it as a precautionary uh, measure, um, but we don't think you're right. So this raises kind of issues, you know, at this point, you know, so yes, he removed the water pump, he got the approval of the local town board, that was fine, all good and dandy. Um, but if you think about it, you know, how were Londoners in the area now expected to get water, right? You know, we didn't have the same infrastructure where we had water in every single apartment or every single flat, um, anything like that, you know, this was kind of the water supply. So you could make the case that there was an ethical dilemma and where he removed, you know, uh, you know, fundamental need for water from, from a bunch of Londoners um, without getting their approval, right? And without figuring out a way to provide for them, um, you know, if they, if, when they did eventually need water. Um, in today's day, this is why we have that IRB and that ethics committee in place. And there's actually, you know, tons of legislation protocols in order to protect human subjects um, and participants in trials so that something like this um, couldn't happen um, without the correct, uh, what should I say, the correct, um, you get the point, right? So, so basically we'd make sure that we, you know, participants did have water. We'd figure out a different way of getting water to them. Um, so you know, no need to worry. Uh, we're not going to remove your water access here if we want to conduct a similar study because of that you know, ethics committee in the IRB. So moving into, once again, my favorite part, which is the actual collection of data. Um, so what he went, did is he went around, collected death records, conducted interviews, he surveyed local landscapes, he obtained maps of the water and sewage systems. Um, this was all done before and after the pump handle was removed so that he had something to compare it to, you know, pre-pump handle and then post-pump handle. Um, on the right is one of his famous maps where he actually plotted out, you know, where all the deaths are occurring. It's kind of hard to see, but they're little black squares. Um, and then he, he, you know, some of the local infrastructure, um, the red star in the center is actually the pump in question. And then on the left is some information about um, the number of cholera deaths per 10,000 houses um, as supplied by different companies. And all these companies had separate um, watering infrastructures, right? Their pipes didn't interconnect. So you can see that the South, South Wark and Vauxhall um, Water Company had a significantly higher death rate for 10,000 houses than all the other companies. Um, so he was able to isolate it into these uh, specific areas I and mean, eventually to the pump on Broad Street. So once all the data has been collected, time to analyze it, time to see, you know, what's going on. Um, you know, did the pump handle make a difference? You know, is that pump giving people cholera? Um, so we have a graph here. We can see the outbreak of cholera on August 30th see how quickly it skyrocketed to, you know, over 150 um, fatal cases a day, uh, and then back down a little right after that. And you can see there was a little spike around, uh, it looks like August, uh, not August 20th, um, around September 8th, um, right as the pump handle was being removed. And then right after that, it went straight back down and it lasted, um, it went away. Um, now, some information about cholera, it does have a small incubation period um, so it's expected that once someone was contaminated, they would actually hold on to it for a few days before they actually start showing symptoms and inevitably, you know, end up passing away. Um, 
And then on the right here, we actually have a little heat map, um, which is a very, it's, it's pretty much the same map that we saw on the earlier page. Um, just instead of the, the, the black squares of people's deaths, we just have a concentration. So red is the highest concentration of death, followed by orange and yellow, et cetera, until you hit the blue. And that red zone is concentrated right where that Broad Street water pump was. And then once you have your results, you want to publish the findings. So he actually wrote um, on the mode of communication of cholera. Um, it was published a few times. Um, unfortunately, at that time, it wasn't widely accepted. Um, it was kind of actually ridiculed and laughed at until after his death. Um, and, but it was really intended to inform readers about the scientific evidence he used to support the theory of cholera contraction, as well as its consequences. So now we know germ theory. Now we know, you know how diseases are spread. We know all this more information that he didn't at the time. But at the, at the heart of it, this was just a simple research study that he, he was able to conduct. You know, he had a question. He went through and you know, designed a you know, study. Um, he got the approvals from the town boards. He collected that data. He looked at the data. And he eventually published what he discovered or what he thought you know, you know, he, he rationed with the evidence supporting it. Um, what we know now um, after his death is that the area was actually excavated um, and looked at a little deeper and they found out that there was a cesspool right near um, the watering well um, that was only about three feet away and both of those were compromised and leaking. And um, then looking back at even more previous death records, they can find out that it was one infant that died from cholera and the mother discarded the infant's waste into that cesspool. And it was that one contamination source that contaminated the water and continue this epidemic. So it was a constant contamination source. Nobody was getting, for the most part, contaminated from local cholera you know, patients or victims. They were being contaminated continuously from this water pump. Um, and if you go there today, there's plaques and you know, you saw the, that little monument um, water pump and there's actually a little red brick that you can see and that's where the original water pump was. So if you're ever in London, um, definitely go and check that out. It's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. It's a big, big part of medical history. Um, and then with that, I think we'll go over some questions, comments, concerns, anything like that again. Um, I know once again, a lot of information, hopefully the story format helped people a little, it was a little less dry than um, just going through the different steps and procedures. So no questions on our end, um, but Lara Varden brought up a great point that often with studies um, there are confounding variables um, when it comes to especially holistic health and other lifestyle and environmental factors that can affect a person's response to their treatment. Um, do you have any comment on that? Uh, Kyle and I both commented back, um, but do you also have any comment on that? Um, which type of study were we talking about particular? Really, I, I, um, I think she just mentions all um, mm -hmm. So both Kyle and I responded back, especially regarding uh, randomized control trials. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in a, ran in a beautiful picture perfect randomized control trial, right? You have identical twins and everyone is the same or triplets or even quadruples, anything. You have identical people where the only difference is the experimental intervention or it's medication, whether it's something else or just a device. Um, you know, and, but unfortunately that doesn't exist, right? That's why those pragmatic trials are really gaining traction right now. And even the observational trials, you do have those confounding variables and that muddies the water and makes it so, you know, sometimes very difficult to see. Now, luckily we have those, you know, statistical tools and the algorithms and even machine learning platforms right now that can help us analyze this information. Um, but once again, that's kind of where that pragmatic sense gets into it. It's like, yes, confounding variables, they muddy the water, they're going to be there. You know, nobody is, is, is picture perfect, the same as the next person. Um, but if you can get just a large enough sample size in relation to how many people will be using this, you know, this intervention, um, you can start drawing more clear conclusions just by the sheer number of people um, partaking in it. Um, and once again, like I said, the confounding variables of someone that lives in the United States might be very different than someone that lives in Europe and different from someone in Africa or South America or Asia or anything like that, you know, because, you know, there are different populations of different lifestyles. Um, you know, in the video, we saw some confounding variables being, you know, whether patients can afford their medication. 
I know right now with that COVID-19 vaccine that I've mentioned, uh, the one from Pfizer, that's, I believe it's phase two, and the first interim analysis report said it was 90% effective. They said that this is great and all, but we have a serious problem where the, the vaccine itself has to be stored at negative 80 degrees Celsius until administered, right? So, you know, that's a pragmatic problem, right? You know, so how, you know, how is this vaccine gonna be stored in local clinics? How is it gonna be shipped around? Where is it gonna be manufactured? You know, so a pragmatic trial on how um, getting this vaccine out there might be um, beneficial. Um, so see, you know, you know, yes, it exists, but is it accessible? Um, and, and things like that. Um, not, not the best example, but you know, hopefully, hopefully that clears some things up. Um, okay, so now that Dan has given us this great background in what the research process looks like, what are the different types of research that we can conduct, um, I want to get into the four um, engagement principles here that PCORI has laid out to make sure that we are engaging with all of our research partners during the research process. So we can go ahead to the next slide and we can start with um, reciprocal relationships. So defining that, um, we can say that reciprocal relationships are demonstrated when all of the research partners, including maybe especially the patient, um, will have a clearly defined role going ahead with the research project and also making sure that everyone involved in the project has a role and has a decision-making authority. And we're going to decide those things as a team. So making sure that it's always collaborative, everyone is always on the same page about what their particular role is in the project. So next we have co-learning, maybe one of the most important principles we have here. So we can demonstrate this when we're making sure that researchers are helping patients to learn about the research process. Um, but then on the other hand, we also wanna make sure that, that researchers are also learning from patients um, about the needs of the community, about particular illnesses that people might be experiencing. So this is really um, an emphasis on the co here, the co-learning. Um, we want it to be a two-sided experience, a multi-sided experience where it's not simply the researchers um, educating the public or patients about particular things, but also understanding that researchers and doctors have just as much, if not more, to learn from that patient community. So this kind of gets to the heart of actually the theme of these presentations, which is leading together, learning together. So then next we have the partnerships engagement principle. So we can demonstrate this when we're really making sure that everyone's time and contributions are respected and valued, making sure that um, where applicable um, patient partners, for example, are being compensated for the time that they're putting into the project. And also committing the research team to diversity across all project activities, really making sure that everyone or as close to everyone is represented during the decision-making processes um, of the study to make sure that each unique interest is being brought to the table. So the final engagement principle we have, number four, uh, is called transparency, honesty, and trust. So this is kind of the foundation for um, engagement with the research partners. And we can demonstrate this principle when, again, we're making sure that decisions are made inclusively. Um, everyone is involved in the process of decision making. Um, you're never excluding anyone, including the patient partners who are involved, never excluding, always making sure that information is readily available to all research partners. Um, and then finally, making sure that all partners, whether it's a researcher, a doctor, a patient, any other stakeholder, 
is always committed to that open and honest communication. So those are your four engagement principles. And now um, to give a sort of example of maybe what not to do when it comes to engagement, I wanted to talk a little bit about this, this term helicopter research. So we can define that as, as you see on your screen, um, a research project in which scientists study a local population group, but they make no effort to engage with the local community or even share the results with them. So it's kind of an example of when researchers kind of swear off those engagement principles, don't make an attempt to, to follow them. And we're gonna look at a specific case where they, where they weren't followed and see what happened. So like it says, in 2018, there were some researchers from the United States who did a study on Indonesia's Bajau people um, because they realized that um, the, this population had a, a unique um, ability to supply extra red blood cells to their body. So the, the findings of the study actually did support what they had hypothesized, which is that, yes, they do have an extra supply of red blood cells, which comes from um, they have larger spleens as compared to the general population. So that's great. We have um, gone through the research process. So it seems like we have started out with a question, we've done the methods, and we did find and we found evidence to support that hypothesis. The problem comes into play when you look a little bit closer at how the, the study was actually conducted and there was an article posted in response to that paper that they released um, criticizing the fact that they really neglected um, the engagement principles that I've just described because they failed to collaborate in any meaningful way with the local community um, over there in Indonesia. Um, and the, the community actually they felt that they had been exploited by those American researchers. Um, they did some interviews with the local researchers in Indonesia, and they, they said there was virtually no communication between the two groups. Um, so it felt very much like an exploitation case. So that's, of course, not what we want um, to see in the research process. Um, trying to tie it back to the North Country, for example, like the last thing we want to see is these researchers from out of the area come into our community and sort of study our population for any of the unique um, characteristics that we have. Um, just kind of coming in, taking some samples, and then heading back out to where they came from, doing their own like independent analysis back there and then making no effort to put the, the findings back into the community, which could actually benefit from it. So cases like these are a big reason for the implementation of patient-centered outcomes research, especially in local communities. Um, we need to make sure that the local patients and the community members actually can benefit from the research that's being done on them um, for this to happen. Uh, we need to do our best to follow the engagement principles, make sure that research partners are involved in every step of the way, like I've described the four principles back there. And especially, I think it's worth repeating, uh, we have to commit ourselves to sharing those results with the populations that could benefit from them. Um, and after all, that is really the whole point of doing research, uh, which is to help people. So now that we've heard a little bit about what not to do um, and what can happen when you don't engage with those local populations. Um, I thought I'd switch it over to maybe a more optimistic note uh, and share my personal experience with patient engagement um, during my time on the clinical research team. So this can hopefully show you what patient engagement can actually look like. So Looking back on the first time I ever went on a patient visit, actually with Dan here, um, 
I can kind of retroactively identify the ways in which patient-centered outcomes research was a big part of that and seeing how the engagement principles were always a top priority during those appointments. So I, I'd say the most important example of this is that throughout this particular patient visit, um, we'll call the patient here, uh, John Snow, call back to that history lesson, John Snow is the patient. Um, we tried to really make sure that John was on the same page with us every step of the way, um, especially when Dan was introducing a new medication or new information, making sure that there is that open exchange, um, making sure that any questions that John had were always either answered in the moment or making sure that we could go back and do some research and get back to him when we did find the answer. So, and this also to get, to bring in the co-learning element of it, we could also learn from John by hearing about any new symptoms he was having, um, any just new information that he could bring to the table. There was always that co-learning aspect where we were learning from each other the whole time. Um, I was really impressed actually by how open uh, and effective the communication was. I mean, um, I was pretty new to the department back then. So it was pretty refreshing to see this very productive, um, engaging and welcoming environment that Dan had already established with the patient, um, John. And you could really feel just the, that energy in the room. And seeing that John was so at ease with taking part in something as maybe intimidating um, as a clinical trial and knowing the direct benefit that, that he could potentially get from the study. And with my current knowledge of the engagement principles of patient-centered outcomes research, I, I really believe that those individual patient visits and the study as a whole were so effective and successful because they were patient-centered. They did have the engagement principles always at the forefront, whether we were consciously aware of that or not. So hopefully this little example helps to paint a better picture of what I really mean when I talk about the engagement principles and to show you what patient engagement can look like in the real world. So to get to some conclusions about our engagement principles here, um, you may have noticed that the four principles, they're a bit broad and they seem to leave a lot up to the actual research partners. And that is intentional, I believe, because no two research teams will ever be exactly alike. Um, like it says here, you're gonna have differences in demographics geography, the healthcare setting. Um, we know living, and those of, those of us who live in the North Country, we know how unique this area is. Um, we know the strengths and challenges that, that come to us by being in this area that we may not even have to consider if we lived in, say, a bigger city like New York City. Um, so it's about being flexible in your approach. Um, again, defining together uh, reciprocal relationships, what sort of approach will work best, um, always striving to demonstrate those engagement principles. Um, and if there's one thing that I would like you to take away from these engagement principles, I would say that it's that the research process should not be one-sided, which is to say that the researchers should not be making all the decisions alone. Um, I think research that is truly patient-centered will take efforts to always value the input and the contributions from patient partners, always learning from each other and collaborating with them on a meaningful level. Great job, Kyle and Dan. That was wonderful and very informative. I like the combinations of the, the stories and the, the details. You did an excellent job with an overview of, of the research process and those engagement principles. Um, so I did want to remind everyone that you can throw questions or comments in the chat, but especially during this um, ending question 
portion, please feel free to raise your hand, um, even just for a, a discussion, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. One thing, um, as people are thinking about questions and entering them in, it was nice because we've been part of this patient-centered research program for the past year. Um, so speaking of co-learning, we have been learning with the patients program of the University of Maryland um, and our stakeholder group of patients, providers, and community members. And as we've been learning all these engagement principles um, and hearing about the elements of patient-centered research, it's been a really nice reminder to reflect back on the processes that we did already have in place that have fell in line with these principles, like Kyle talked about. We've always put patients at the center of our research processes and what we do here, but being a part of this patient-centered outcomes research engagement award and program has really solidified that and helped us even focus on patients even more and bring their input in. So it's been a very valuable process um, and we've been learning on this journey just as much as everyone else in this group. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, in the chat, you're getting lots of thanks. Um, excellent, excellent job. <laughs> and I appreciate uh, all of these, um, everyone who's come both to the first presentation and the second presentation. I think by the end of the three, you're gonna be, um, I won't use the word expert, but well-informed on patient-centered research. So I don't see any questions, just people singing your praise. Um, so I'm gonna open up the evaluation poll if you have a moment to just um, answer these questions, you'll see the, the knowledge checks again to see if we were successful in um, providing you with the knowledge to understand patient-centered research and the research process. And then the, the last section of the questions are direct feedback. Um, similar to the last event, I'll be sending out a link where you can provide written feedback as well. So be on the look for that. And as you're doing that, um, I see the results coming in. So I appreciate that. We really do take your feedback into consideration. Um, something that we received in the office really recently, um, I can tell you about quickly, because it shows that not only are we valuing the patients um, more and more, but also the pharmaceutical industries are as well. And we had participated in a heart failure study um, a couple of years ago, and we had multiple patients enrolled, um, but we just received in the mail some pamphlets for the patients communicating the results of that trial. So there really is an industry-wide movement towards valuing the patient's input and communicating the results. Um, it was written um, in lay terms and it had lots of graphics and showed what questions were asked and if they were answered. Um, so it was a really nice demonstration of, of making sure you have that communication piece like Kyle was really pointing out in his, in his section. All right. Well, with that, I'll leave the poll open so I don't cut anyone off who's filling that in. But um, anyone who's already entered in the poll, feel free to get on with your day. I really appreciate you being here today and learning with us. And I hope that you join us for our upcoming COVID sessions and our final Learning Together, Leading Together session in December. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.